there we go. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. I'll keep an eye on the text chat. And uh, let's, let's, without any further ado, let's get to it. So the first thing is, and I don't want this to sound hypey. The first thing is, we're going to get into this a lot, but this right here, I trade the first two hours of the day. As a day trader, I focus on 9.30 to 11.30. So let that sort of be the baseline of everything we're going to talk about. My main focus is from the bell to basically the end of sort of the morning session. All right. So I think right now, this, this slide is probably as appropriate as it's ever been. And I'm happy to sort of say that while this is no longer 2020, 2021 has been full of opportunities, but it's not the same market. And we know this. And so for my office here, our mantra is, this is a brand new year. Let's forget about what happened last year. And if we've noticed what's happened lately, especially through 2021, but after we had this latest earnings, the struggle is real. I mean, I, this is a very uh, topical title. We just had CPI this morning. We know what happened to the market after we saw that inflation number ping, one of the highest levels it's seen. And we saw the, the tantrum the market threw in the aftermath. So, you know, a lot of this, don't know where to start, tired of getting stopped out. We're going to talk about what I do the first two hours of each and every day with emphasis on entries and, and validities and targets, again, all within the first two hours of the day. So a lot of what we're going to talk about has a time limit and for a really good reason, that, that fixed time that I like to focus on. All right, so what is the fix? And I do want to also mention, are we looking at large account trading? Are we talking about small account trading? I think the most important thing, especially with the micros having coming out, having uh, been released, is we need to have a scalable mindset. I'm not, I'm not great at uh, drawing on this, so I'll make sure I don't do this a lot. But the scalable mindset is really, really important. Your account size does not matter. It doesn't matter if you're trading $2,000. Well, that's a small account, but it doesn't matter if you're trading 2K or 2 million. All right, the rules are the same. So we're gonna get into my plan, my tools, my rules. You know the first one, the most important one, first two hours of the day, all right? All right, so um, for those of you that may not know, I'm Raggy Horner. And again, thank you so much for Chato Trader and for Peter for hosting. I'm the managing director of Simpler Futures. Uh, and uh, I have a mastery also at Simpler Trading called the Sector Secrets Mastery, where I trade ETF and stock options. I've been with Simpler for about seven, eight years now, but I've been a futures forex options trader uh, I've, for coming up on, this will be about the 33rd year. So, um, well, forex, I've been trading for about 20 years. Uh, futures and uh, stock options, I started in my late teens. So again, a little bit about me. One of my favorite things is to teach. Again, super glad you guys are here. I love to trade. Uh, I love to teach. I think once you find a certain degree of success, you know, that passion for teaching others. And, and really to, to sort of, I'll tell you this, to sort of one up the big boys, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. You know, I want you guys to avoid those mistakes. I think retail traders can be very successful. So uh, just a little bit more about what I've done. A couple books, traveled around the world. One thing I've noticed about traveling around the world, lecturing, teach, teaching from Paris to Jamaica, is a lot of the mistakes that traders make are universal. The same mistakes that I saw being made in Seoul were the same things I saw being made in Montego Bay. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty universal. So what are the paths to success? I have a plan to control risk first and foremost. I'm going to follow that plan. I'm going to show you what I do. Time is part of that. There is a system to being successful when you're day trading futures, frankly, when you're day trading anything. And, and we're talking about futures trading, yes, but uh, just so you know, this applies to the way that I day trade ETFs, ETF options, stock and stock options as well. So something I think is very important when it comes to success is having an approach that's both universal and robust. It works well and it works on everything. So how do you measure success? It's got to be PNL, gang. That's it. You know, it's it's I'm measuring success based on week to week, month to month. And probably the most the two things that I'm probably most proud of in my career 
are, I've, I've never had a year where I was not profitable, certainly losing days, uh, certainly losing weeks. Uh, this week has been trying, no doubt about it. But when we step back and grade ourselves as day traders, gang, I've never had a losing year where I wasn't profitable. But again, don't worry about the bumps along the way. You want that upward curve of your PL. That's the whole focus. So let's start breaking down some of these trades. All right. So I'm going to get into some of the lingo as well as the setups. So this is Thinkorswim. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're using Thinkorswim, TradeStation, TradingView, what have you. This is not about a particular brokerage. Um, most of the tools that are on this screen are free. There are a couple that are premium. I can tell you uh, later on if you're interested where to get them. But most of the tools on this screen are free tools. I've been giving away about 80% of my tools since the beginning of my career. So what do we have here? This is the NASDAQ futures in a five minute time frame. So let me just give you a quick run through what's on this chart. There are three moving averages right here. Those are the 34 period exponential moving averages on the high, the close, and the low. So 334 period EMAs, high, close, low. The color coded candles, you'll notice these aren't sort of normal uh, Japanese candlesticks. These are what I call grab candles. Grab is an acronym for green, red, and blue. That's it, green, red, and blue. And so what they these candles do is they let me know when a market is mostly bullish, when it's more neutral, and when it's bearish. So again, color-coded candles, green, either shade is, uh, the darker shade is a down candle, the lighter shade is an up candle, but green is bullish, okay? Blue is neutral, red is bearish. So right off the bat, and I don't start looking at trades until the bell rings, and we're monitoring the first 30 minutes, and we'll have a few examples like this, but I'm monitoring the first 30 minutes. Oh, there, okay, hang on one sec. Um, let me grab, let me, give me one second, gang. Let me do this here real quick. Uh, and I wanna make sure I'm seeing all the questions, just in case you guys have any questions. Let me make sure that I've got that. I know we're in webinar mode and that's, that's fine, but I just wanna make sure if you guys do have questions along the way, that I'm able to see them. Okay. All right, I think we're good there. All right. So this is a breach retreat. And what that means is the first 30 minutes of the morning, there's a high, there's a low. This is pretty classic stuff. And what we've done is we've broken through the high of the first 30 minutes. What I then look for is the market to retrace into a zone. And in that zone, I am a buyer. That's really it. I think there's a large group of traders that might look at the momentum here. I will usually forego that and wait for the market to pull back. So what's what sort of the guidelines here? Monitor the high low of the first 30 minutes, your clearing or opening range, wait for that to be broken, and then look for a retracement. We'll get into that retracement uh, in a little bit. All right, so where do I start my day? First two hours, right? That's number one. First two hours after the bell. First 30 minutes, that's the setup that I showed you all. That's the time to take the temperature of the market. That's where I marked the high. That's where I marked the low. This is really important here, gang. This is something that I wanna mention. Since November of 2003, I have had a long only book. In other words, I think it's very important to be a directional trader. It keeps you from over trading. And what do I mean by directional or a long only book? I have not shorted as a day trader since November. I've only been looking for long trades. Yes, there are those days where I'm gonna get stopped out when the markets continue lower, but I found the way to keep from over trading is to be a one way or directional trader. And then give the market time to show you what's going on on any given day. Notice that in that example that I showed you, I waited a full 30 minutes till after 10 a.m. Eastern to even put on the first trade, right? So yes, I'm only trading two hours uh, and, and I let the first 30 minutes pretty much transpire before I did anything, all right? Let's go to another, let's go back to that trade and look at a few more things about this. So looking back at this trade, I gave the market time to breathe. Again, no rush. Once the market breached higher, 
through through that clearing range. Uh, I knew to be on the long side of the trade. That's the market tipping its hand, gang. The probabilities are what we're playing. Nothing are certainties. Just like they say when you're fishing, it's not fish, it's not catching, it's fishing. There's no guarantee. You guys know that. However, once the market breaks through the upper end of the range, there is a higher probability that the market is going to be a little bit more bullish. So that clearing range measures the high low, and I'm looking for the market to make a higher high and then retreat or retrace. That's why I call it the breach retreat, okay? So again, what are the tools in this chart? I'm monitoring the first 30 minutes here. That There's a tool that's running there, but let's dive a little bit more into these indicators that I kind of alluded to earlier. So I mentioned the 34 EMA on the high, the close and the low. I call that the 34 EMA wave and the grab candles. This is a free tool, gang. You can find this free on uh, Thinkorswim, TradeStation, TradingView, that's a free tool. Uh, another tool that I use is a simple think script that monitors the 8, 13, 21, and 34 period exponential moving averages for their structure. So at a glance, I'm able to tell how they're relating to one another. So green is bullish, red is bearish, blue is neutral. I'm very color coded as you can tell, right? And so some of the things that I love to see in a great strong bullish market is this double green where the eight is over the 13, the 13 is over the 21 and the 21 is over the 34. That to me is a double green market. And I monitored the 34 separately from the first three EMAs. This is more of a trend indication while this is more say sentiment and momentum. All right, the last thing you'll see on my charts are these dots, also a free tool available on TradeStation, Thinkorswim, TradingView, and they're called propulsion, propulsion dots. And they combine moving average crosses with a moving average replacement. We'll get into more of that, but it's a, it's a dynamic indicator like any moving average would be. And it lets me know if there's fuel in the tank. It lets me know if the markets are starting to structure in such a way that there's a likelihood for movement. All three of these, of course, are price-based tools, right? These are all different ways of looking at the slicing and dicing, open, high, low, close. Well, you guys are fans of market profile and relatedly volume profile. Well, volume is a big part of what I do. So enter the VWAP, volume weighted average price. So I got curious about what to do with volume early in my career. A uh, VWAP is a tool, by the way, created by the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> Go figure. So I like an anchored VWAP, volume based, right? I'm, I'm looking at the way in which there's a moving average of volume, if you will. Uh, I, I like the volume profile. So now we're talking about value area high, value area low and point of control. So if you were to sort of start with a baby step into market profile, where would you start? You'd start at volume profile typically. So I know where the 70% of volume is on the chart with of course the point of control being where the most volume took place. So I'll keep it pretty basic. I'll look at those three individual levels. All right, here's where things get a little different. These are two indicators that I've created. Um, I created this thing back in 2008 and that's the V score. Now simply what is the V score? It is the standard deviation of volume weighted average price. So I got really curious about, about pulling Z scores on, on different indicators. And I found that pulling a Z score, getting the standard deviation of a VWAP gave me a really good idea when the markets wandered too far away from the mean, not from a price perspective, but from volume and price. And I'm talking to a group of people, and this is so great, that understand the importance of volume. Gang, most traders out there, and you know this, are one-factor traders. They look at price. They look at price-based indicators. The cool thing about talking to a group like this is you guys know the importance of time in, in, a, in, a, certain, in a certain perspective, you, but you know the importance of volume and how volume and price give you a completely different look at the market that isn't just found at high, low candle bodies, et cetera. So what I tried to do is not add another price-based indicator, but start to incorporate volume into my trading. So I have the V-score, which sits at the bottom of the chart telling me about how far away we've wandered from the mean. And then I have the bands, 
which I can see on the charts, which show me where the support and, and the resistance would be related back to this V score. So these, these two tools are, are related. So standard deviation, lots of volume weighted average price emphasis here. All right. Okay. So before I get too far ahead, gang, this is a free tool, or I should say a free resource. And, you know, a great way to keep the conversation up, get more information on, on my ongoing analysis is head on over to countdowntrader.com. And whether it's longer term or whether it's shorter term, I update the analysis here twice a week. So you can just head on over here and uh, again, free tools. And if you want to be alerted to when I have new content, you can just put in your, your email and your first name, last name, and we'll send the new updates to you. But one of the other reasons you're going to want to head on over to Countdown Trader is for the free tools. Like I mentioned, these are free. I don't have, I don't have any free you know, tools to sell you here. You can go grab those tools right from that website. Grab Candles, Darvis, and the Propulsion. So you can go download those right from that website. And uh, I believe we have some explainers that accompany that as well. All right, so that's countdowntrader.com. All right, back to the charts. So we know what the tools are, you know where to get them now, countdowntrader.com, and where to get some of my ongoing analysis. Again, all free. So right back to some five minute intraday futures charts. This is a pretty choppy chart. So I'm going to show you where the volume for me, these volume tools come in handy. So I think most traders would look at this chop. No problem. Number one, pick a side. I'm going to be bullish. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Fade the range. Well, I have a pretty simple approach. Buy from lower. And if I am looking at a short, it's got to be near the highs of the range if I'm looking for shorts at all. Now, I don't know that we'll get time to jump into this tonight, but I do want to mention the daily time frame is what helps me determine the bias, not the intraday alone. I spend uh, a few minutes on the daily time frame each and every day looking at the overall trend of the market and looking at some of the volume weighted average prices that I anchor to that market to determine whether or not I would prefer to be long generally or short. And again, I've had a long only book since November 3. So what do I do here? Choppy market. Well, if I know the markets are choppy as they reach the bottom of the range, how do I know price-wise that this is the bottom? Well, frankly, I don't. But if I start to refer to volume plus price, you can see down here what this is, is the standard deviation of the VWAP telling me that essentially that rubber band or that range has been stretched to an extreme and clearly nothing's a guarantee, but there's likely going to be the market snapping back to the mean or beyond. So this is what I'll look, I'll look for, the market getting down to the range. I'll also mention it makes a lot of sense to wait till 10 a.m. The signals will be better for darn near everything after 10. Okay, so yes, I'm only trading the first two hours of the day, but I don't mind letting the first 30 minutes of the day go by. Not, not every time, but... I think for a lot of new traders, avoiding the clearing range will be something that will serve them very well as they're, as they're navigating their way through the markets. All right, next chart is the S&P, another five minute chart. And again, trend day or not a trend day. Uh, the, the market looked weak only to remain above some key clearing range levels and resting on some volatility support. We'll talk about volatility here in a moment. Then we let the VWAP, the volume weighted average price, do the heavy lifting. All right. When did we cross the VWAP? I have three VWAPs. So for those of you that anchor VWAPs, let me tell you where I anchor them. 2 a.m., 7, and 9.30. 2 a.m., 7, and 9.30. That's where I anchor three volume-weighted average prices. So I get a cluster. I get a zone. Just like, a, just like I like a zone of moving averages, I like a zone of the VWAPs as well. So what happened here? Again, remember, I want I want to either wait for the market to breach or I'm going to already have a bullish or bearish directional bias from the daily. Well, the market breached here. And if I'm already bullish, that's just two confirmations to stick with the long side of the market. And you can see here, there's my retreat. I took a little bit of heat, 
but we stayed above the clearing range low, which was really important. Got above the volume weighted average price at this point, market never looked back. Notice the market had to sort of overcome a few obstacles. I never got down to, to a V-score confirmation, but this breach and this retreat gave me what I needed, staying above the clearing range low, getting above the VWAP, green. Look at the market also dominated by the green grab candles. A few red here, one, two, three, three blues. That's it, six candles that were not colored green within the sea of green this morning. Very hard to want to short this. Stick with that flow, all right? Let that VWAP do the heavy lifting. All right, next chart here is uh, another S&P chart. These are all 2021, by the way, gang. Every example we're going through is 2021, all right? Uh, and this, did I just pull up the same chart? Hang on one sec. There's something else I wanted to go over with you guys on this chart. Oh, yes. Let me let me go to what I wanted to cover with this chart. This area here, profit taking is, is a difficult thing, especially when the markets start to trend. So I like to take profits while I can, not when I have to. All right. One of the easiest levels to take initial profits at and then move a stop to break even is the clearing range high. It may not always be the sexiest profit target. It's always nice to think the market could go out into the stratosphere. But one of the first things that I will tell my traders to do is take profits while you can, move a stop to break even. And then at that point, you've scaled out of a trade, controlled your risk, and done your main job as a trader, which is pay yourself. I know a lot of people say your main job as a trader is to control risk. And I, while I do think that's true, I think a huge part of risk control is a very prudent initial profit target. So by scaling out at a more prudent conservative type target, first target, I can scale out of the trade, reduce my risk by way of position size and move the stop to break even. And then I'm able to be a lot more ambitious for the remainder of the trade. And here this V score is kind of reminding me yeah, we're, we're kind of getting a little, and you can see here, we're getting very close to that clearing range high. And the V-score sort of reminding me, hey, you know, go ahead and pay yourself. This market might be at, at the top of its range, but then it broke out and it continued higher, which is great, which is great. But pay yourself while you can, not when you have to. All right. So something else I want to cover as we go through this is a, uh, a tool that's unique to my trading. And we're kind of going beyond volume now and getting into a little bit of uh, volatility, all right? A little bit of volatility. So what is volatility? For me, it's the historic likelihood of price movement. I think for most traders, you know, for me, I'm going to take a historic look at volatility. What is its role for us to understand where the market could go in either direction? What is the market capable of? So I'm going to talk about something called PMRs, price movement ranges. Uh, this is something that's unique to what I do. I want to definitely share it with you all because if you're already, you know, clearly fluent in volume and price, now we're adding a third factor. So volume, price, volatility, and finally time. And for me, time is what? Clearing range, economic events that might increase volatility throughout the day, the European close, midday doldrums. That's what I mean by time. All right. So we're going to talk about price movement ranges, and this is what they look like. So what I'm able to do is break down price movement in a couple different ways. I can break it down uh, as almost like a variant of an average true range where I've got a six month look back at the typical price movement of the S&P in this case. And I'm able to break this down with an outlook of 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour. This is always moving. Every hour of the day presents a different historic volatility profile. So I can, I can be very granular with very short-term projections of what pr price is likely to do based on the six month historical look back. I can even get as big picture as how many points could be expect in that day's, that trading session, that day's session. 
uh, every day of the week has a slightly different price movement range profile. Another thing that's really helpful with uh, this kind of information is, for example, I think when I pull this, I forgot how many points we had on that particular day, but 800 points, a lot of people say, whoa, that's a lot, right? Whatever a lot is, these subjective looks at price ranges. The truth of the matter is, if you look at the entire week and you look at what the market is capable of in terms of simply price movement, this is not direction gang, this is just high to low. The Dow is capable of moving pretty, pretty frequently on the upper end of, of movement, almost a thousand points. Your average is about 800, 750 to 800. So imagine knowing what the market's capable of doing with about a 68% probability. That's what this information is. Six months back, 68% probability. So it's basically going to tell you what happens two thirds of the time. You can also break this down to the hourly. I could break this down and I don't know that I have the slide for it, but you can also break this information down hourly where I can see how the market moves from, from midnight to 11 p.m. And it's broken down with these same kind of bars, but on an hourly basis. So you can see the difference between 2 a.m. when Europe opens, 3 a.m. when London opens, 4 a.m. when the Asian markets close and our actual, our volatility contracts. And then when it picks up again around 7 a.m. and of, co of course just explodes higher at 9.30. All right, so we can break this down to projections. We can break this down to daily levels and we can break this down hourly as well. And, and the cool thing about this is we can then plot it on the chart. All right, so here's the chart of the five minute Dow. And I wanna show you where these volatility ranges come into play. Now, again, you'll see the short trade triggered thing. All that means is the bottom of the clearing range broke. But if I have a, a very strong Dow in the daily, which we know we have had, again, these are, these are recent charts. The Dow has been the strongest of the four indices. Macroeconomically, the Dow is going to be disproportionately strong because of reflation. Forget all that for a minute. We got right down into the support of the volatility. That's what this is right here. This is that projection of what happens between 10 and 11 o'clock based on historical volatility and it gets projected right onto the chart. What else happened? Well, there's my V-score going off too. So I, I have bullish bias on the Dow. It's the strongest of the four indices. I have a historical volatility range, again, the HPMR that we traded down into. And my V-score is saying, yep, we're down at some volume-based extensions, meaning it, it's extended too far. It's extended too far, it's time for it to snap back. So volume plus volatility at work on this chart. So again, I've got directional bias, I'm following the overall trend, path of least resistance. I get this nice volatility exhaustion low. And then we just follow the trend to the upside and just pay attention to obstacles like the aforementioned clearing range high, another volatility range, the upside there, Got a value area high up here, cut the point of control here. But again, picking the direction, not getting short down in here, that's the first step. That directional bias is really important. Okay, next chart is the NASDAQ, I believe, or do I have another Dow chart here? I think I have another Dow chart here. Okay, so in this case, uh, this is a range. Now, I'll tell you what, gang, trending, trending markets are kind of easy. As long as you're not fading the the rain, fading the trend, as long as you're respecting the trend, those days that just sort of grind higher, those are gifts. I think it's days like this that are far, far more difficult. So what do we have here? Well, once again, the market broke down. And I think that that suckers in a lot of momentum players. What do we know? The V-score is telling us, nope, we're at the bottom of a volume-derived standard deviation study. Okay. Markets bounce from there. Terrific. Again, I don't have a breach scenario because I breached to the downside. Am I going to short the Dow? No, the Dow is the strongest index so far this year. So what do I do? I take advantage of that move higher, and then we ran smack dab into the volatility resistance of the HPMR. This is not an unusual situation. This happens quite a bit. We went from one end of volatility range 
to the other. You see that? And the V score confirmed that. So chop is not a big deal. In fact, in some ways, I prefer chop. I think I think there's a lot more uh, capitulation that we're able to take advantage of in chop versus say um, just markets you know, those days with just grind higher or grind lower. I think those are deceptively difficult days to trade. But it's really nice to know we can handle chop without well getting chopped up. Okay, so let's let's recap a bit of what we talked about so far. And again, I'm happy to take questions. And let me see here. All right, here we go. Oh, I had the private chat over top of the question. So we'll go back and review the questions in just a moment, gang. And thank you for your patience. And I'll be happy to, I'll happy to uh, cover that. All right. So again, the best measures are PL curve. We know that. Uh, we're not home run hitters here. I don't believe in home run hitting. I believe in just sort of grinding it out, taking a little profits as often as I can, keeping my 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 risk as low as I can keep it. But that's how you have a nice upward trend in your PL curve. The first two hours after the bell rings are the best hours for day trading, at least for me. I've gone over the years, starting from the mid 90s when I was day trading mostly stocks, and I have I found that the morning, when I, that AM session, for me is is the best. It's also for me the crispest uh, volume information. So I will I will very rarely continue to trade after 11:30 a.m. You saw that every one of those trades, gang, we entered and pretty much hit our first targets before 11:30, and that's the way I like it. My trading is designed to be sort of compact in that regard. And and finally, what the clearing range and breach retreat are is how to utilize the first 30 minutes of the open. So we're not talking about going out, guns a-blazing, rapid-fire trading from, from 9.30 on. Notice another thing that I showed you on those charts. It's not uncommon for me to have maybe one, maybe one to two, I say maybe one to two trades per index every morning. So that's right. I might have one day trade, maybe two every morning. It's a very... Um, slower moving, non-active style, okay? Volatility, what is it? Where to find it? How to use it in your trading plan? So in this case, that was that was the uh, those clouds at the upper end and lower end. I'll talk a little bit more about those if you guys have questions about it, but I use historical volatility to identify support and resistance. That's all that it is. At the end of the day, V-score, clearing range, volume profile, HPMRs, it's just support and resistance. We talked about how to use volatility to establish expectations. So not only could I use those volatility levels for entries, for confirmation of potential support, but I could also use them for targets. If I'm wrong, and it happens, gang, if I'm wrong and the market does not hold the V-score, does not hold the HPMR support, when I leave that zone, I've got a pretty good idea that the market is not going to, well, be in be in my favor. I can know pretty quick when volatility and volume levels are broken that I need to shut things down. Really important. So that stop loss aspect to V-score and the HPMR is huge. When I'm wrong, I'm going to know because we're not working within sort of the normal volatility and volume tendencies. As soon as things are not working the way your tools would say is normal, that's a great reason to exit stage right. Okay, so uh, that's a lot of stuff to show you just working two hours a day. And I don't say that to be all hypey, like, oh, just make money in two hours a day. I'm telling you that because the rest of the day becomes really a nightmare for me. So I do have a class for this. It's called the Ultimate Day Trading Strategy. You can check that out at... Uh, Oh, that's a strange little URL down there, but bit.ly Roggy Day Trading. So bit.ly forward slash Roggy Day Trading. Uh, and it'll break down what I did over the course of growing an account from 7,500 to 75, was it 75? I think it's 70 or 75,000 in just over a month and a half. This is a 2020 uh, set of trades, gang. Now, I think day trading through 2020 was very different than buying and holding through summer. But nonetheless, this will walk you through everything that I showed you. So it's about a six-hour class broken down into an e-learning module. But I also want to remind you guys, 
uh, countdowntrader.com. This is the free resource. Uh, you know, if you want a little bit more information about what I do and how I do it, that's going to be a great secondary resource for you. But yeah, you can check this out at bit.ly. Uh, bit oh, this little, yeah, <laughs> forward slash Rogi day trading. Okay. Now, the cool thing is I did a lot of live trading. So if you want to see the way in which I did this live, uh, you can see that in the elite where we recorded the live trades and you can see the way I put this to work in a live market because, you know, frankly, that's the most difficult part of this, right? We learn in, you know, Saturday, Sunday, uh, when the markets are closed, but at the end of the day, what we want to remember is it's recognizing the nuance when the markets are moving and making these decisions in real time. All right. So with that being said, let me go ahead and tackle some uh, questions here with you all. And how do I determine position size on my first trade? All right, let's go back to this chart right here. So Ed, thank you for the question. How do I determine position size on my first trade? Ed, I have an unusual way to look at this, and I call it market money math. I use fixed ratio approaches. What I wanna do is ask myself, is this an aggressive level uh, or, or moderate or conservative? That is not a probabilistic conversation. That is the distance from the entry to the stop. So the wider that chasm is from the entry to the stop, the lower, the smaller my position size or exposure should be. Now I mentioned earlier that I like to day trade options on ETFs and stocks as well. Well, I'll oftentimes, and I know the micros are something that are available, but old habits die hard. Micros are a very new tool. It's not sort of my go-to. What I'll usually do is if I'm trading the YM, but I'm at an aggro level where the distance from the entry to the stop is rather wide, I'll actually buy DIA calls. I'll buy calls to control risk. And if you've looked at the uh, Friday expirations and day trading ETF alternatives to the futures contracts, you know, we're talking about contracts that are usually sub $2. You know, these are usually very inexpensive options. So position size is based on risk, all right? So do I start with multiple contracts or leg in? I leg in, I scale in, and my smallest position, the aggro will be first, moderate is slightly larger, conservative is my largest position, and conservative happens to be the one as closest to the stop. So what method do I use to protect, per, uh, protect for liquidation breaks? So Ed, what if I'm wrong, right? How do I protect myself if I'm wrong? I could say it's my stop loss, but how do I measure that? Persistent V-score breaks, persistent hourly price movement range breaks. Uh, it could be also breaking major psychological levels. Uh, I showed you all the data that I use for the HPMRs. You know, something that I started doing late last year and I've do been doing a lot more this year is I've been using the expected price movement ranges to deal with volatility. And if my, my, my trade is projected to be open for say, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, I'll look at the low projections for the, for the expected price movement range. And if I start breaking these, it's, it's probably a pretty good sign that I'm on the wrong side of the market. So it's going to be the culmination of all those things. So the easiest way to protect my downside is to recognize the entry to the validity. My validity is usually going to be the opposite side of the clearing range or these, uh, ex these volatility ranges. Remember, the volatility ranges are basically sort of uh, capping or book, book, book bookends to the upper and lower end of what typically the market is capable of moving. So if I break below that, that's a significant break. You're talking about a liquidation break. I'm talking about a volatility break. That would be a significant break. Uh, let's see. Do I anchor my VWAP to 27? It's all Eastern time zone. Yes. Anytime that I was mentioning Ellis, it's all East Coast. You got it. 2 a.m., 7 a.m., and 9.30 a.m., all East Coast time. Any reason for using, hey there, Joe. Any reason for using 8, 13, 21 period EMA? So, Joe, it's it's been a couple decades, but I went through a, a time where I started testing exponential moving averages set on Fibonacci numbers. 
And, and that's why I settled on 8, 13, 21. Now, I tested, the, and, and, and 34 for that matter too. All the moving averages on my chart save the 200 exponential, all based on a Fibonacci number. And when I started testing, back testing the way in which Fibonacci numbers acted as one, dynamic support and resistance, and two, sort of a general trend, uh, sort of a, not a trend line, but kind of giving me a general trend, I found that those moving averages were the best. And I, I tested the series beyond 34. I went to 55, 89, 144, all the way to 1597. Yes, I tested the 1597 exponential moving average. And I found that the 813, 21, and 34, and really even 55 to a certain degree, were excellent for containment of healthy trends. All right. And thank you for the question. Uh, let's see. NQ and ES. Yeah. So Captex asking, what about today? Um, in terms of, yeah, what's hap what happened today? So two things have happened and I, I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but two things have happened. And so definitely check out Countdown Trader because I think some of our upcoming uh, issues over at the free newsletter, wherever that slide was, there it is. We're going to talk about some of the key things. We're going to talk about the, some of the key things that have happened in the last two weeks that have ha actually had us re-examining whether or not the long only side is the way to go. Suffice to say, the Russell and the NASDAQ broke that about two to three weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I'd say. The S&P and the Dow are testing that right now. But right now we are in a, I mean, and I'm talking in the last two weeks, last count, last two calendar weeks, we've, we've actually broken some of that directional bias where two-way trading or even in the case of the NASDAQ, shorts only would be the way to approach the market here as we're in mid-May. All right. So yes, CapTech, from when I was looking at this and these chart captures versus, and this is just a few weeks ago, compared to right now, yeah, there has been a, a, a distinct shift. And that's really based on key levels on the daily that I track using VWAPs. Um, is the daily range a proprietary tool? How different is it from standard deviation? Stephanie, so uh, I, I believe that the, well, it's proprietary number one, yes. Uh, but you have access to it. There's a, there's a company that does put this data out. It's the same company that I use their data to, to project those highs and lows, and it's called Auto Chartist. And so um, that data is a six month look back of the typical price movement range. And yeah, I think they pull, again, 68%, it's a standard deviation. So it's both, it's proprietary, it's a six month look back and it's a standard, you know, the standard deviation study of, of that uh, typical movement, right? It's not going to account for the extremes, which you would consider to be the 32% extremes, but it is going to account for two thirds of what we typically see. Okay. All right. Um, are these my own indicators? Well, I mean, clearly I did not invent volume profile or the VWAP, but yes, the, the V score, the, the grab wave, the candles and the wave and the um, bands that go with it, those are mine. And then the HPMR. So yes, most of these are tools that I've created. Yeah. Uh, so Braille, yes. You know, sometimes you just don't have the information you need with what's out there. And again, I think, again, you guys are volume profile, market profile fans. You know how, and practitioners, you know how this works. There are so many price-based indicators out there. I don't need another price-based indicator on my screen. I need volatility. I need volume, right? I've got the price-based indicator understanding there, mostly with moving averages. But then after that, I want to rely on volume and volatility. So when I couldn't find what I needed, yeah, I just started creating tools that answered the questions that I needed answered. Yeah. Okay. So do I always use the five minute chart for day trading? Catherine, I don't. Uh, I've used the one minute in the in the past or the five. But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter if it's one, two, five, seven. It really, it really doesn't matter. Uh, what matters more is gauging the first 30 minutes of the day, finding those high lows, using the daily time frame to to determine directional bias. So it really, it, these, these setups will work if you trade a two minute chart, 
These setups will work if you use a one minute chart. And, and I've been using a five in an effort to sort of slow things down for myself, but I'm, I'm a fan of the one minute too. Uh, I'm sitting in front of a computer setup, Catherine, that has nine monitors. So I'll usually have one monitor on the five minute, and then I'll have four screens that break down uh, everything from the, the uh, S&P, NAS, Australian dollar, crude oil, Dow, VIX. I'll have all of those with these same tools uh, on a one minute chart. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, do I trade the Globex session? Larry, I actually don't. Uh, guys, I, I, when I tell you I trade the first two hours a day and that is it, that's that's my focus. Uh, I spent 1995 to about 2002 day trading, those seven years, all day. And I found that the exhaustion and unhappiness level uh, for me was extreme. I did not like trading all day. If you are going to trade Globex or trade the uh, the latter part of, say, the session, Asian session, I wouldn't start till eight. And if I'm going to trade in the morning, pre-market, uh, this is where the Forex trader in me comes out. I like 2 a.m. to 7. So I'm not going to recommend that. But I'll usually look, say, 2 a.m. to about 7, maybe 8 o'clock, uh, or 8 p.m. to about midnight Eastern. So I truly do just focus on those first two hours of the day. And I just try to let go of whatever happens the rest of the day. Now, granted, some of the positions that I put on in the morning could continue. And, you know, this brings up a really good a secondary conversation. And I know, you know, this is something that I think probably a lot of you do, because I know Peter's both a futures trader and an options trader, as am I. And so by focusing on the first two hours of the day, what it frees me up to do is look at end of day charts, the latter half of the session. So after 1130, I'll take a break and then I'll come back around 115, 145. I might be managing open trades, whatever is remaining of them. If we happen to have one of those grinding higher type days, but I'll start moving over to the end of day charts and I'll start scanning for opportunities in the industries and the sectors. And I'll start trading options with more of a swing type approach. So one of the great things about, you know, what, what we talked about early on is focus on the two hours. What this allows me to do is, is focus on the sectors. And if you're already an S&P, NASDAQ, Dow trader, you're already watching XLF, XLV, XLK, XLE, XLI, uh, XLC. You're already watching a lot of these sectors whether you know it or not, because the stocks in these sectors are what make up what's going on in the S&P, the YM, uh, and the NQ, right? So all I do is I just embrace that part of my life, leave the day trading behind at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, and, and I actually start trading options. And I start day trading, uh, not day trading, swing trading or overnight trading with the goal of days to potentially weeks being the goal. And, and actually, uh, you can check that out if you guys would like. That's over at uh, sector, simplertrading.com forward slash sector. So that's just a different part of my trading life. But I emphasize that because again, um, so many traders like myself and Peter, we don't just day trade all day. There are other parts to our life. I don't want to put words in Peter's mouth, but I've been a fan and following his work for a while. And what I really like are traders who are well-rounded. And I'm sure Peter would tell you the same thing. When you are not just looking at one minute time frames or or five minute time frames when you also have daily end of day time frame uh, trades working for you as I have long copper long corn long crude oil you know how much pressure that takes off you to not have to put on a trade as a day trader a well-rounded approach where you've got an end of day approach coupled with an intraday approach I think it's going to allow you to cherry pick and better trade both because neither one is the one that you have to pay your bills with. It's a, it's a much more holistic, totalistic approach if that, if that sort of uh, hopefully resonates and makes sense. One of the reasons I can be as cherry picking, one of the reasons I don't need to have frequent active uh, twitchy day trades is because, well, A, the slower approach works for me and B, if I don't like anything that's happening in the day trading world, I have my end of day trades working. And as I like to remind my traders, 
a day trader's best friend is the next session. If you remind yourself, gosh, Monday doesn't look good. It's not looking like I needed to look. Let me let me take my medicine, pull some losers off the, you know, just go ahead and take my, my medicine and take my losers. And remember, I can get to, I can do it again tomorrow. Fresh set of eyes, fresh set of opening ranges, fresh set of volume levels and volatility levels, and just try all over again rather than take a small divot of a day and turn it into a pit. And I see a lot of traders do that. They try to trade their way out of a single session loss and, and they wish they never did everything that happened after those first few losses. So the way that I'm able to really combat that, stick with the first two hours and then just switch on over to longer term timeframes. I've done that two Tuesdays in a row now where it's where I just said, gosh, you know, Tuesday, it's not working out really well, got stopped out. I switched to my daily time frames looking for opportunities. So I hope that uh, I hope that resonates with you guys. Um, do all those indicators cause any cognitive dissonance when they don't line up? Uh, Craig, I'll tell you what, I, I think that when they don't line up, that's a really good cue to perhaps trade smaller or not at all. I think there's a really powerful for sure. I think there's a really powerful cue to, hey, these are these are not lining up. I don't like the setups. So I'll just pass. Again, going back to, hey, maybe it's time to look at those end of day charts. Maybe it's time to take a look at something else, but not persist when you don't have an edge. And we know this. We're always looking for edge. I think clearly, as you mentioned, is that one indication of not having edge? I completely agree. All right, I completely agree. Do I ever use, hey there, Ken, fantastic. Oh, thank you, Ken. Again, big thanks to Peter. Um, like I said, I've been a fan a while. And uh, again, it's a, it's, a real, it's a real thrill to talk with you guys. Do I ever use volume or tick-based bars rather than time-based bars? Ken, I like time-based bars. I do. Uh, I know that's not everybody's uh, preference, but I do like time-based bars. There was a time when I would look at the first two hours a day and literally count candles. I knew what I wanted to see by the eighth candle. I, I knew what I wanted to see by the 15th candle. So I do like them being broken up into intervals. Thank you for the question. Uh, and, and I appreciate the, the, the uh, feedback. What about the last hour of the day? High volume there too. Stephanie, there's a saying that amateurs open the market and professionals close it. And if I'm gonna be in the ring with anybody, uh, even after all these decades, I'd rather be I'd rather be up against the amateurs. I have found personally that my best two hours of the day, my best hours of the day are 9.30 to 11.30. I have found personally, and I think it's important for someone on this side of the microphone to just tell you guys straight up, I don't like trading the clothes. I don't think I'm anywhere near as good trading the clothes as I am trading the open. So I just put my best foot forward. I acknowledge what my strength, my power band is, and I stick with it. And of course, remember, decision fatigue is something that traders, day traders definitely deal with. So for me, by the last hour of the day, I'm pretty exhausted mentally that decision fatigue starts to set in. So I just stick with where my power band is. Do I set stops? Stephanie, I'll look at the lower end of the V-score being broken, HPMRs, clearing range lows, psychological levels, but I do not use a physical stop. If I'm concerned about volatility and risk beyond the hourly price movement ranges that I've shown you guys, and you know, think about what an edge data like this is. I'm told what the market typically does. And as soon as the market starts to behave atypically, I'm probably really gonna do what? Tighten my stops, or if the market begins the day atypical, I'm going to use options to trade. And so that's the way I manage risk. I will have stops, but all my cards in the table, I do not put physical stops in the market. I know where they are, but I do not put physical stops in the market. I haven't put physical stops in the market in 25 years. I always know where they are, but I do not put them in the market. Um, how does the V-score differ from Bollinger Bands? Um, Scott, the V-score is based on the volume weighted average price. So right there, the calculation is completely different. Bollinger Bands are great, don't get me wrong, uh, but the V-score is based on volume weighted average price and the standard deviation of it. So, so right there, you're gonna have a slight difference in, in, in what the calculation is. Uh, do I use market internals? Ken, I'm gonna say something that's gonna make me sound like a heretic. I could care less what the ticks are doing for the most part. 
I, if there's an extreme tick reading, it'll get my attention. But as a general rule, I do not look at market internals. And why? Let me tell you why. Before you guys think, oh my gosh, this woman's off a rocker. There are six stocks that pretty much move the market, especially when it comes to the S&P and the NASDAQ. You guys know the six. Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, a pair of Googles and Tesla. You can turn the pair of Googles basically into Alphabet. So Alphabet and Tesla. Unless I'm looking at a market internal that waits. See, if tick was weighted, that would be interesting to me. And I've played around with that concept before. If we had a tick weighted to a high concentration, the way that the Dow is weighted, the way that the S&P stocks are weighted, the way the NASDAQ is weighted, if the trend was weighted in that way, I would be far more interested. So I don't look at market internals because in my in my estimation, it's measuring a bunch of things that I don't care about. And frankly, neither does the market because the weighting of a lot of those names are, are think of the S&P, the top, I believe six or seven stocks, definitely the top 10 within the S&P 500 are account for 20% of the, of, the, of the weight of what moves it. Five, so 10 stocks, I think it's actually less than 10 account for 20%. So that's why I don't really care what internals are doing unless I get an extreme reading sometimes of the tick. But even then, I really don't pay attention at all to, to what most people, uh, you know, your put call ratios, tick, trend. I don't really pay attention. I'll look at the VIX, but the VIX is a futures uh, symbol as well. So I will look at the VIX. So if you want to look at the VIX as an internal, I don't because I think it's actually more of a, a futures contract. All right. So um, the HPMRs. So yeah, Star Lord, if you want more information about the HPMRs, where the HPMRs are published, do I put that into the? Uh, it, yes. So so I update those rather regularly. Yeah. So the 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 HPMRs based on this data have to be updated regularly because volatility is always changing, contracting, expanding. So I have to update those. Yes. Um, am I relying on pre market? I do rely on a good bit of pre-market. By anchoring to two, I'm looking at the European Open. By anchoring to seven, I'm looking at when the volatility first starts expanding in the US and then anchoring to 930, clearly I'm anchoring to the bell. So that's the three psycho psychological slices that I'm that I'm focused on, yes. Um, Hal, thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you, gang, thank you for the feedback. Y'all are super kind, uh, I really appreciate that. And again, big thanks to Peter. Um, I hope, yeah, these are a little out of the box, aren't they? Um, how many contracts am I trading in the three indices? Again, um, I don't want to emphasize what I do. It's for some people, it's going to be rather small and to other people, it might be rather large. Uh, if I'm fully in four markets, I'll have up to 48 contracts. That's if I'm fully scaled in across four, let's say NAS, S&P, uh, Dow, crude oil, or, or Australian dollar, uh, I'll be in up to 48 contracts. So I'll, I'll be somewhere maxed out about 12 minis per, knowing that if I get an S&P trigger, I'm likely going to get a NAS, or if I get a Dow trigger, I'll likely get an S&P, and then the crude dollar, Australian dollar might follow suit. So I do trade those two uh, commodities as well. All right. Uh, what else do we have here? Day trading rule. When it comes to futures, no day trading, no pattern day trading rule. And when it comes to options trading, gang, I'm I'm long calls, long puts. So I'll do that in a cash account. And that's the easiest way to get around the pattern day trading rule. All right. Uh, is the volatility analysis or the volatility ranges? Eric, I actually give those to members. I, I don't charge for those. I just They just have to be updated. So we just make that a part of the membership for uh, the sector secrets and for the futures room that I'm in, okay? And again, I think what you guys will find that a lot of these levels and a lot of these directional biases are gonna line up with things that Peter, not every day, I mean, I, again, every, there's always gonna be nuances, but I, I read that shadow trader every morning and I'll tell you what, most of the time, I'm gonna find that uh, they're in, in sync and I really like that confirmation. I really like the confirmation of that uh, volume profile analysis that Peter does on the S&P in sync with what I'm looking at in the Dow, NASDAQ, S&P, crude oil, Australian dollar, et cetera. All right. Uh, do I use order flow? I do have book map. I don't use it a lot. 
and I'm not always looking at it, but I will look at it for key levels. I, I will look at it for key levels. Joe, uh, yes, the anchored volume weighted average price. It's a, it's just criminal that more platforms don't have an anchored VWAP. So yes, um, it's it's one of my own scripts. But again, it's it's just a volume weighted average price with a time or date anchor. So I can so I can do that. Is JT proprietary? It is because I have a very specific way of looking at the moving averages. But blessing, just look at the way the eight is in relation to the 13, 21, and 34. I'll give this to you right now. What's a double green? It's a free indicator. What's a double green? Eight over 13. Or if you want to look at it in script talk, it's 34 greater than 21, 21 greater than 13, 13 greater than eight. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, inspiring and impressing that impressive. Thanks, Stephanie. I mean, that's Peter and I, and all of us who do this side of, of trading for a living, we're just looking to give you guys an edge hopefully. And I hope that's what you've gotten out of this. Just another way to look at the market. That's complimentary to what you're doing now. Okay. All right. So, uh, gang, I, Peter has recorded this, so you guys can review this whenever you'd like. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I really thank you so much, Robbie. It. it was great having you here. We we definitely appreciate it. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, everybody. All right, Roggy, you've got the recording uh, going, right? I do, and I will. I will. I will cut that right now if you'd like. Yeah, that's right. That's fine. Just cut it. But what I was saying, if you know, if you recall from my message, I I could was not able to do it on uh, our side. So if you could shoot it to us, we'd really appreciate it and get it out to everybody. Oh, oh, I, you know what, um, Peter, I hit the recording button in the trading room, so mm -hmm. it should be on the server. Oh, okay, okay, that's true because it's on our side. Okay, that's cool. That's Perfect. right. Yeah, that's it is. So thank good. you, gang. And again, okay. if you if you're looking for anything of what I'm doing, uh, head on over to Simpler Trader. But check out Countdown Trader as the easiest, and it's a free resource for a lot of the topics that we covered today, countdowntrader.com.